Good morning. A steady diet of humble pie is good for the soul. A steady diet of humble pie is good for the soul. Let me repeat that one more time because I hope that it sticks. A steady diet of humble pie is good for the soul. And that leads to two questions. When is the last time we had a healthy slice? Can we even recall the last time we had a good old-fashioned slice of humble pie? We'll talk more about that later, but it is time I ask you to rise as we begin our worship. And we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. I invite you to kneel if you're able. Oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor merciful sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the Holy Hear the good news. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you demonstrated your great love for us by giving your life as a ransom for many. Help us to pick up our cross and follow you as we serve in your kingdom. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. Transgressors, the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Hebrews 5. Every high priest chosen from the mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. 
He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but it takes only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? 
And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Well, I once knew a man who was fired, fired from his very first job. It was walking beans on an Iowa farm. He was just 14 at the time, and he lost his temper in the heat of the moment. And that boy, he learned a valuable lesson from the experience. A steady diet of humble pie is good for the soul. I also once knew a pastor who had an embarrassing moment in the early days of his ministry. He was leading a graveside service at Fort Snelling. And once the brief service was over, the funeral home director came up to him and quietly and privately informed him that the zipper of his pants was down. Well, the pastor, he learned a valuable lesson that day. A steady diet of humble pie is good for your soul. I also knew a pastor who once said something truly careless, something that he regrets to this day. He was getting ready for a memorial service later that morning, and a funeral home director was working with him in the sanctuary. The two were all alone. And never having met before, they took just a moment to get acquainted. And the funeral home director explained that he normally worked another side of the business. Over the years, he had literally picked up hundreds, maybe even thousands of bodies corpses and brought them to the funeral home. And so the pastor remarked, you must be used to death by now. And the director looked at him and replied, you never, you never get used to it. And it was a great sermon and the pastor never forgot it, even though it was delivered a decade ago. And he learned a hard lesson that day. A steady diet of humble pie is good, good for the soul. Well, I'll give you one guess, because the three stories, the three accounts that I've shared with you all involve one person. Do you want to guess who that person was? I'm the person who made each of those. I'm the person who made all of those foolish mistakes. But what about you? What about you? What about you here in worship? What about you worshiping at home? When is the last time I ask you that life, that life served you a good old fashioned piece of humble pie? 
Well, in our gospel lesson this morning, we could go so far as to say that Jesus handed James and John and entire pie, and he then encouraged them to eat each and every piece as the others looked on. It's time we turn to our sermon text, our gospel lesson for today. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they asked, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and let the other sit at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking for, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am to be baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You are going to drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left It's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And when the ten heard about this, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Oh, oh, how those disciples tried the patience of their Lord. But then again, If I'm honest with myself, and if I take a good, hard look in the mirror, I also try the long-suffering patience of my Lord. What about you? Now, some of you might recall just a few Sundays ago, on September 22nd to be exact, we overheard the disciples arguing about which of them was the greatest And now, in the very same chapter, two of those disciples come to Jesus with a foolish, with a prideful request. Why, I guess that even humble fishermen aren't immune to the most deadly of sins. And there's a warning for you and me this morning. Not a one of us, not a single one of us here this morning is immune to the temptation of pride. So let's return to our sermon text. James and John went to Jesus, and I sure hope he was sitting down when they made that request. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. And I can't help but wonder, (sighs) did Jesus let out a long sigh before he replied, what? do you want me to do for you? Let one of us sit at your right and the other sit at your left in your glory. Well, let's chew on this exchange for just a bit. You see, the desire for prestige and honor and glory is an old and ongoing temptation for the entire human race. And if we think that we're immune to pride at this stage of our lives, we're only fooling ourselves. The ancient world was obsessed with status and the desire to stand out. And the sin of pride even afflicted the most religious of peoples, as Jesus clearly reminds us. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. If we're honest with ourselves, Let's admit it, pride can creep into the heart of the believer just as much as it can the pagan. Let's keep in mind what happened in the Corinthian church. Some in that congregation argued about which of them 
had the greater spiritual gifts. Almost anything, anything under the sun can become a temptation for pride. So what about us? Where, where this morning, where today does pride lurk, lurk in our hearts, pouncing to strike? Well, let's go back to James and John, and most of all, to Jesus. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink, or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Yes, we can. I imagine they quickly answered. Jesus said to them, you are going to drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. The disciples had no idea just how foolish, how foolish the request was that they had made. You see, they were literally asking Jesus to die. They were asking Jesus that they might be killed next to him. Jesus mentions a cup and he mentions a baptism and he's referring to his fast approaching crucifixion and he's been trying, trying, and trying to prepare his disciples for all hell that's about to break loose but without success, because the cup of which Jesus refers to is the cup of God's wrath, his just punishment at human sin, and this includes yours and mine. Later in his account of the gospel, Mark writes that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, sit here, while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then he went on a little farther, and he fell to the ground, and he prayed that if possible this hour might pass by him. Ah, but Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Which leads us back to James and John's foolish and pride-filled request. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. This had to be, this had to be deeply upsetting to Jesus because he knew what was to come, not only for himself, but also for his two disciples. Jesus said to them, you are going to drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right and my left, it's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Well, who? Who were those places prepared for? They were, pla they were prepared for two thieves. You see, Mark chose his words very carefully when he records what happened on Good Friday. It was the third hour when they crucified him. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus was surrounded by sinners when he was born. He was surrounded by sinners every day of his life, and that includes, most especially, when he took his last breath. Jesus, the King of glory, showed and shows us. He shows the world the humble greatness of the crucified God. You know, the kind who dared to die between two thieves. He was a servant to the bitter end, and he gave his life as a ransom for many, as had long been prophesied. And let's remember, Let's remember what he prayed on that dark day that we now call good. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, was that prayer only for the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, for those who unjustly accused and condemned him? Did that prayer also include the likes of Pontius Pilate, who ordered his execution? 
And then what about those Roman soldiers, including that centurion, you know, the ones who literally nailed him to the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Could it be, could it be that Jesus' prayer also encompassed James and John at that moment and the foolish, prideful request that they had made? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And what about you? And what about me? Make no mistake about it, Jesus intercedes for us this morning. And you don't have to take my word for it. Listen carefully to what the Apostle Paul had to say to the first Christians in Rome. Christ Jesus who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Think about it. Think about it. This very day, Jesus is praying for the likes of you and me. What a friend we have in Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Is there any doubt? Let there be no doubt how the Father chose and chooses to answer his beloved son's prayer. Well, I want to close by giving you, by handing you, by serving you two more slices of humble pie to chew on this morning. James did go on to have a glorious, but also an oh-so-sad distinction. What am I talking about? James was the first of the 12 to be martyred. His death is the only one of the 12 that's recorded in Holy Scripture. And this happened midway through the book of Acts. Luke writes, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now I'm sorry to be so graphic and grisly, but we need to understand what happened. This means that James had his head chopped off. And I can't help but wonder, what was that like for John when it came time to bury his brother, to have his head and his body put into the ground separately? Well, this much we know for sure, that along the way, John finally learned his lesson. And it's one of the hardest lessons we have to learn in life. It's about pride, and it's about humility. You see, of the four accounts of the gospel, John's is the only one to record the fact that Jesus took time to wash his disciples' feet on the night before he was crucified. Jesus was literally, as he had said, a prophet and a servant to the very end. And John included this brief sermon as to what, was Je what Jesus was doing in that upper room. Christ poured water in a basin, and then he knelt down. He got down on his knees like a slave, and he washed their dirty feet. And John adds this commentary, having loved his own, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And where would we be without it? Where would we be without the full extent of Jesus' love? I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad that we don't have to find out. Amen.
have heard the word of the Lord and what it means for our lives. So I invite you to rise and join with me in confessing our faith. We do so using the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of the earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand. God's throne of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. I invite you to kneel if you're able. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you demonstrated your own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Help us to rest in your unfailing love. God of love, Amen. Heavenly Father, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Absolutely nothing. And all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Help us to praise you all our days. God of love, Amen. Heavenly Father, we love because you first loved us. Let our love be sincere. Help us to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. We pray this for all the baptized, including Steve, Pam, Kurt, and Lucas. God of love, Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are abandoned, exploited, or mistreated. We bring before you all who feel unloved or unlovable. God of love, Heavenly Father, help our love to not grow cold. Help us to show our neighbors what your love is like. God of love, Amen. Heavenly Father, your love is never ending. Show your love to those who are sick, injured, or dying, including Paula, Melody, Gail, Brian, Pat, Scott, Nypenny, Dane, Gina, David, Tim, Kathy, Ben, Bob, Jean, Roger, Jolene, Dennis, Tim, Benjamin, Jeanette, Heidi, Gertrude, Ed, Liz, Marie, Larry, Angela, and Bob. God of love. Heavenly Father, by the power of your Spirit, keep us steadfast in the one true Christian faith. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Our worship now continues with the gathering of the offering.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
May the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true Christian faith unto life everlasting. God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. One announcement before we conclude our service. Several days ago, I received a formal call to serve as the pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church in New Ulm, Minnesota. 
So what does that mean for our life together? Well, I have several weeks to consider that call and where the Lord is leading me to serve next in his church. So I ask that you keep me, that you keep Redeemer in your prayers, that you keep our family in your prayers, but I also ask that you keep our saviors in your prayers. You know that we are in the midst, the beginning stages of a merger with Cornerstone, and so we know that this was part of the plan. I hope to uh, make a decision in the next several weeks, and you'll be among the first to know. Typically in these kinds of situations, a formal letter is read at the end of a service at both congregations on the same Sunday. So thank you. We conclude our service this morning. Go in peace and serve the Lord.